Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amulya Chavuturi, a hydroclimate data scientist from UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology, Wallingford. Um, unfortunately, I cannot join my colleagues today at the Howell campus in person, but I'm thankful that I can give my part of the presentation online. Today, along with me presenting are my colleagues from UKCEH, uh, Richard Smith, Wilson Chan, Burak Bullet, and Nathan Records. We all together are going to be talking about advancing water resource research, use of jasmine in hydrological innovation. We thank the jasmine team for giving us the opportunity to present our work today. Importance of water resource sciences cannot be emphasized enough. And I would like to bring your attention to the image on our title slide on the right. This is a drone image by another colleague of ours, Nick Everard, showing the flooding that happened this January over the Oxfordshire region. Most of us were able to directly see the impact of this flooding event. For the people at UKCH, the worst impact was due to the flooding of our local pub in Wallingford, which was on the riverbank and thus got inundated. Um, but on a serious note, these devastating <coughs> impacts of water resource research is a fundamental uh, fundamental is of fundamental importance as it is it not only has real world implications in today's world but will also be imperative for future sustainable water resource management and hydrological hazard mis mitigation next slide please in this talk, all of us are going to be showcasing examples of our research focused on water resource science, in which we are already using high-performance computing resources from Jasmine, or plan to use Jasmine's resources to aid our science. Next slide, please. As with most domain-specific sciences, in hydrology, also, we use Jasmine computing power for many different reasons, ranging from data storage and analysis to model simulations, and even for training and development. Next slide, please. The examples of use of Jasmine specific for water resource sciences are storing of large ensemble, high resolution data sets, which are available for long time periods, on Jasmine group workspaces, processing data by applying methods like bias correction uh, by using the high compute power of SLOM on Jasmine, analyzing data by extracting extreme events like floods and droughts using the pre-existing packages on Jasmine like Jaspy or Jasper, applying machine learning methods using scikit-learn Python packages to cluster data points within data sets, using Jasmine's latest cloud computing resources like object store to store and analyze data sets, running dynamical models like jewels using rows and silk suites. And finally, Jasmine can be used for training and development by using <coughs> packs like data labs, or even by getting specific training accounts that Jasmine team can facilitate for us. All of these examples show a very brief window into Jasmine's contributions towards water resource science. In the following slides, my colleagues and I will delve into a little deeper of specific research topics where Jasmine has already heavily contributed or we plan on using Jasmine resources for future work. In this particular slide, um, the work that we were aiming at was identifying homogeneous regions of rainfall. Rather than considering UK rainfall having the same characteristics throughout the country, we realize that different regions have different hydrometeorological patterns. To cluster rainfalls uh, over the regions, we applied k-means clustering, which gives us, which ultimately gave us two regions of unique patterns: the northwest and the southeast, as shown in the map on the left. This means k-means clustering. This k-means clustering was performed using high memory partition of the jasmine slum, as with as the number of data points that were there in the data sets for clustering were very large and could not be done using any other partition. With this analysis, we were clearly able to showcase links between the North Atlantic salinity 
and regions of UK rainfall and stream flow at very long lead time. On the right hand side, the precipitation is shown on the top and stream flow index is shown on the bottom. So we were able to identify clear links using this analysis that we did in Jasmine. Next slide, please. Uh, in this work, we were aiming to provide global hydrological forecasts using methods of bias correction and multi blending. This work is relevant as we are aiming to provide global hydrological forecasts that will easily be usable by stakeholders and which will also work on ungaged catchments where there is no observation data. And th thus, we can develop capacity to provide consistent forecasts around the world. Currently, this work has been done only for sample catchments for baseline simulations, for which we did not use Jasmine. However, for the next phase of work, we plan to implement these methods on ensemble seasonal forecasts all over the world, um, over all of the data points over the world, which means that is a large amount of data that these seasonal forecasts generate. And thus, we plan to process the data on Jasmine as we would have higher amounts of storage as well as processing power there. Next slide, please. As mentioned before, we also use Jasmine for training and development through something called the HydroTools Summer and Winter Schools. These summer and winter schools are freely available and done online. During the school, we run a hands-on training uh, session called, through the Jasmine Data Labs where the students learn how to run the HydroTools model, and then next, how to analyze and visualize the simulation outputs. These tra training sessions were made easy to Data Labs, which can provide platforms for using Python and R through Jupyter Labs and other means. Matt Brown will be talking more about Data Labs in the next talk, so I will leave the details up to him. Next slide, please. This work is being led by Doran Camus, where we are working towards downscaling ER5 reanalysis variables originally at approximately 25 kilometer resolution down to one kilometer resolution over UK. The downscaling of ER5 is done using machine learning methods, which incorporate station data and static fields like elevation into coarse resolution ER5 grid. This data set is available from 1950 onwards, the current time period. And when we convert 25 kilometer into one kilometer grid over UK, that also creates a very large data set. And the processing power that we need to run these simulations, the downscale would be required, would be used by the Jasmine resources. This has been done so that we can create real-time one kilometer resolution data over UK, which can be used for input for hydrological models. Richard Smith will be talking more about this in the next slide. Thank you for your attention. And over to you, Richard. Next slide. Okay. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Richard Smith. I'm a Data scientist at EKCH, uh, along with the media, the guy said. Um, I work in the water resources systems group. Um, so do lots of hydrological data rambling kind of thing. Um, so yeah, quick bit of on the slides for the kind of things that we do. Um, so yeah, the media mentioned in the last slide about the downscaling of the air five data. Um, so this is just an example of how we might um, and incorporate that into a into a workflow, into a um, yeah modeling framework, if you like, uh, using Jasmine. Um, so the goal of this workflow is to um, eventually output a, a near real time one kilometer UK based Jules model outputs. Um, so Jules is the um, hydrological model um, UK CH. Um, so obviously to create this one kilometer. Model, we need the one kilometer driving data, which is what the error flight downscaling is providing. Um, and yeah, we really want to operationalize this and have it running in near real time, um, feeding into the Jules model and, and having those model outputs uh, available to the community. Um, so, using things like the Jasmine Rocket Store um, and the data labs, as Amelia's mentioned, to help um, disseminate that to the community and give some 
training potentially there. Um, so yeah, all this kind of utilizing the um, silk and very sweet um, within the injection um, to yeah to try those workflows. Um, so yeah, the other thing that I kind of do at CDH is um, I lead the data system side of the Cosmos UK network. Um, so Cosmos UK is UK CDH's um, soil moisture monitoring network. Uh, we've got uh, over 40 um, soil moisture monitoring sites across the country. Um, live streaming this data, we obviously have to find that data and, and do some processing on it. Um, so just some innovations that Jason has helped us out with within Cosmos UK. Um, obviously, we're getting all this data. One of the things we like to do is obviously quality control that data. Um, so Doran, who Amelia mentioned earlier, um, working on machine learning modeling. Um, he's done lots of work on machine, uh, coming up with new machine learning methods for um, quality controlling this Cosmos UK data um, and utilizing the Jasmine computing power to, to help do that. Um, yeah, the other thing I was going to mention for Cosmos UK is uh, a product we hope to launch this year sometime is a new um, one kilometer gridded soil moisture map based on the Cosmos UK observations. Again, using machine learning models to, um, to train the model to create that one kilometer resolution map based on the observations and also based on kind of five times scale and the meteorology as well. Um, that's me really, so a bit of a, a whistle stop to all that, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us. I'll pass over to Wilson. So thank, thank you, Richard. And so I'm going to talk one slide, one slide for me only. So I'm going to talk about the use of Jasmine in the Canaries project. So some people, <laughs> some, some people online might know the Canaries project as um, a project looking at the impacts of climate change on Arctic and North Atlantic sector and um, the impacts of that on UK extremes, such as um, storms, windstorms, flooding, and droughts. And that's at uh, UKCEH. Uh, we're interested in the impacts of um, Arctic and North Atlantic changes on hydrographic experience, such as flooding droughts. And uh, the main scientific innovation of the Canary Project, enabled through um, Jasmine, is the creation of a large ensemble climate model simulation. So, this is um, 40 members of climate model simulations from historical and future period and um, led from the oh. University of Reading. And um, other people from the Canary team have talked about the creation and the curation of large ensemble climate data using Jasmine um, at the user conference um, a while back. Um, but at EKCEH, um, we're also interested in utilizing existing large ensemble data sets or large ensemble climate model outputs out there already. And um, Jasmine enables us to kind of store and download and process those existing large ensemble climate model data sets. Um, whilst we wait for the actual canary large ensemble to be produced, and um, we can use those existing large ensemble climate model data sets to um, compare against um, the canary large ensemble when they become available. So, um, the main way I'm using Gasman at the moment in this and within canary is to um, process these existing large ensemble model, model data sets and use them to drive um, hydrological models. Um, across catchments and the UK to simulate river flows. And so um, I use Jasmine mainly in three ways. The first way is to um, collate all the data that are required for hydrological modeling, um, such as observations of rainfall temperature. And those are easily accessible through CEDA from, from Jasmine. And the second way of um, I'm using Jasmine is processing climate model data. So these includes um, processing, storing, and processing, and calculating indices. From um, climate variables such as sea level pressure, wind speed, precipitation, temperature, and so on. And um, William mentioned um, the standardized indices um, in the first slide. So we're, we're also calculating um, things like standardized um, precipitation index and standardized river flow indices um, using large ensemble climate model data sets. And these are made, um, these are easier to do and quicker to do through 
the compute power that Jasmine provides. And thirdly, I'm using Jasmine um, to run hydrological simulations over catchments in the UK. And um, this is initiated through R on Jasmine um, to simulate root flows and, and, and parallelize it through the Lotus um, cube. And an example of this is shown um, on the maps um, in the bottom, right? So this headline we printed is we're looking at kind of the, the impacts of climate change on winter river flows in the UK and the really shows um, the flooding episode we see, we've seen just, um, just this past month. And we're, we're looking at the impact of climate change on the hydrologic extremes um, and, and trying to look at whether or not we can use these modern ensemble data to, to, to gain a better understanding of, of hydrological floods and droughts. And plans next year is to use the Canary Lodge Ensemble on Jasmine um, to process the data, including the calculation of um, evaporation, the bias correction, and downscaling, like I was mentioned by Richard and, and Amelia. And then to use these um, inputs to run our hydrological models um, to look at future changes in blood and drugs. And I'm going to pass on to Barack next. Yeah, thank you, Wilson. And good afternoon, everyone. I am Burak Tulut. I am a hydrological analyst and modeler in UKCEH. I just started three months ago, so today I will just uh, explain what are my future plans to how to use Gatsby. Uh, I divided my work packages into two categories here. One is mostly based on hydrology and that one is agriculture. And in hydrology, uh, first, I will be taking part of development of seasonal simple forecast verification benchmark. And this benchmark will uh, is a tool to understand the reliability <laughs> and accuracy of the uh, seasonal simple forecasts. We will use the hydrogen outputs and, and, we, and we will calculate the, its metrics compare its other, other model results and also the observed uh, sample of data. And secondly, actually, Amulia also mentioned about model blending and bias correction for those forecasts. So basically, we will merge different biological uh, models outputs, and we will make also the bias correction for those forecasts in order to obtain a better uh, seasonal forecast. And in the agricultural part, uh, actually it is not limited with the agricultural only. With the first work package will be about the drought impact estimation. And for those type of uh, analysis, we will use remote sensing data sets in part uh, at high resolution. We will make an automation of these remote sensing data sets to calculate the uh, related vegetation indices. And later, we will try to predict drought impacts in months and months uh, before the event happens. And lastly, the last topic will be about the global scale multi model and scenario based drought analysis. And by using various climate models and scenarios, we will, we will try to uh, understand the effect of climate change on different. Uh, sectors such as agriculture, water resources. Uh, for example, in here, here this is a, my previous study results. And it shows how will a specific winter wheat phenotype uh, will evolve under the effect of SSP3 scenario. So we will gain some areas also in the southern part, we will lose some areas to produce winter wheat. So, yes, this is. Okay. okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, so I'm Nathan McCarts and um, I'm a hydrological modeler, also from UKCH, uh, I'm in the Water Resource Systems Group. Um, and so my work mainly involves developing and applying large-scale models across uh, regional uh, areas so lots of work in India, West Africa, 
uh, we started to work in Malaysia now. Um, and actually, I've, my use of Jasmine up to this point is fairly limited. So we have our own um, high performance computer clusters at CH. Um, so I'm just kind of starting to get into Jasmine, start using it a bit and seeing benefits of using it. Um, so I attended a training course uh, back in 2022 just to get me going, which was really useful. And this is, you know, just kind of throughout this, I can point out how good the, the support, help and training has been to the online process, but also uh, the actual uh, training courses you, you deliver. Um, so my, so these, so I haven't got any sort of nice outputs and projects that everyone else has shown, because um, a lot of these are ongoing, I'm just starting. Um, but my first sort of foray into um, it was in buying notebooks. Um, so we've been using notebooks um, for a machine learning task, which is looking at uh, better representing reservoirs and their behaviors now and into the future, hopefully, um, using machine learning and be able to then place them into our, our models. And so, um, yeah, just kind of, we've worked on this in a team. And the main benefits really have been is, is kind of ease of use and just without knowing anything about how this really, I've kind of managed to, to easily put my work into, into Jasmine notebooks, things like set up environments easily, things like that. Um, and then going forward into this year, I mean, that's, so that's still ongoing, um, but I'm also going to be using Jasmine to um, run some larger scale model runs. Uh, this is going to be using jewels in one instance. This is for a, a highlight a topic um, called the big thought. So this is it's a good name. Um, but this is going to be looking at water resources in a capture in the Alps, a capture in the Himalaya, um, <coughs> and seeing how water resources change going into the future. And um, a big part of this is also we're going to have so we're having earth observation data. So it's going to be lots of data crunching um, and we need processing power. So that's one of the reasons to use Jasmine. Um, and another is you can see here, we're collaborating with uh, University of Edinburgh, uh, University of Birmingham and Bass. And so we need this kind of shared workspace to be able to share uh, not only data, but outputs from the models as well, uh, which is something we don't get with our internal uh, agencies. Um, so that's been a real benefit. Um, and going forward, it will aid us greatly. Um, and the other, the other project, which is similar actually in terms of its benefits. Um, so this is our own water resources model, which at the moment just sits within CH. We're planning to put this on Jasmine Tech and do these big ensemble climate runs. Again, there'll be lots of data processing. Um, and again, it will be collaborating with others. So for me so far, um, the, you know, the main benefits have been around the ease of use for this kind of shared workspace and it's increased processing power and everything else. Um, we have. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of me at my early stages in my sort of uh, use of judgment, but so far it's been all very positive. Um, and yeah, as I say, anything where I've struggled, um, I mean, I could just go to Collins, but it's just as easy to go on with judgment, sort of help desk. And so, you know, even with a question, it gets responded to very quickly. So it's been really useful. Um, next slide. So I mean, this task, we're just sort of running over this um, kind of wash slide a little bit. So speaking to colleagues and um, also from my own experience again, um, it's really valuable actually to have this open dialogue between the judgment team and ourselves. And it's good to know that sort of you guys here that are rather listening um, and sort of trying to make our lives easier. And things just, you know, because somebody like myself, if having not used it before, it's, it's been a really kind of easy entry point into it because of that. And so we really value that and we'd like that to continue going forward. Um, and then, yeah, there's just a few things which we're not expecting to necessarily discuss in this forum, um, but maybe throughout the day, because we'll obviously visit it after the presentations and in the future, are just a few topics which we have a few questions on whether uh, GPU computing, uh, cloud storage changes, uh, Kubernetes, which again, I've got no idea really what that is. Um, a bit fuzzy at the moment, maybe. Um, group workspace uh, migration and uh, Fortran compilers, so that's all systems. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So, next slide. So, that, yeah, so that's everyone who's uh, presenting this first presentation. 
So our contact details are there if anyone wants any more information. And um, just like to say thank you for having us. Um, that's it. All right, so it's my turn. Thank you. Uh, um, yes, so I'm also from, from CEH, but in a, in a slightly different uh, area, sort of a different group. Um, but I'm also going to uh, talk through some of uh, the Jasmine resources that are available and how I've made use of those and, and, and in my group made use of those um, in the various projects and work that we've been doing. Um, so I'm here with my with some of my colleagues who have also given a very brief introduction to some of uh, the work they've been doing. Um, but I think I'm going to focus more on um, not so much the projects that have been I've been working on, but um, where yes, yeah, so it's come into that and where um, it's been uh, most helpful. Um, so to start off, one of the big ones that uh, me and Jonathan actually have been working on um, over the last. Uh, probably a couple of years now, I think, and um, it's been quite a, a longer, ongoing thing, um, is this new and up and up and coming uh, storage, um, I don't know what the word for it is, I want to say software, that's not right, but um, anyway, uh, up and coming storage, which is slowly replacing uh, or complementing, shall we say, uh, disk storage, traditional disk storage, um, which is object storage, or maybe sometimes it's referred to as SS3. Um, this is sort of most useful um, going forward as data sets become larger and larger and then the models, uh, as, to, as the computer models we're using get larger and larger as well. Um, and traditional disk storage starts to struggle um, with this sort of thing um, uh, to do sort of analyses and data wrangling, data crunching, number crunching that we need in the future. Um, it, yeah, I, I think. I can go into more detail what it is um, if more people are interested in that. But I think the main um, thing to talk about here is that because it's a very new, it's a fairly new thing, basically, for researchers and scientists like ourselves to get to groups with, um, but especially for the modelers a lot among us, um, we've been trying to find uh, ways and uh, trying to find ways of helping people get. You start to use it uh, in, in, in easy, easy ways with guidance and with training, um, and sort of um, try um, having the uh, Jasmine's fairly open, large set of object storage resources uh, to test out our workflows and our training resources and how we might use this in the future and how we might um, uh, integrate this into our projects uh, has been incredibly useful. Um, so we, one of the things that we've um, sort of created and, and tested using Jasmine's object storage um, is a, a, a repository of training materials of uh, where we uh, found some got some rich data that we want to work with and we want to uh, convert it for use on object storage, which at the moment is one of the big some big blocks in in getting researchers and scientists to move on to this sort of story or integrate this sort of story into their projects, is that uh, a lot of the time you can't just replace, um, you know, replace a couple of lines in your code and, and you know, SCP or copy your data up to a different server and then the job's done. It's a, a bit more involved and a bit more complicated at this stage. Um, so we've been um, developing a, a repository of training materials that guides users uh, through. Um, how they might, um, or how you can convert a particular data for use uh, on the object storage, and then how, once it's up there, how you actually, what packages you can use, and how you can um, then use that in your own projects and in your own work. Um, and yeah, that's something we've used, um, just in resources for to, to test out, and also for to allow people to run it on uh, just in notebook services and, and data lab, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. Um, so that's a lot about object storage, and we will try to take that a bit further uh, as we well can. Um, so now that we've got this repository of information out there, uh, we're trying to disseminate it more and share it more. So this is one, like, this is one example of that happening. Um, we are thinking we will try and develop um, actual training modules where people can use notebooks and data labs and be guided through this in interactive session. That's something we want to do, um, and something that. Um, I think perhaps is, is more something that might be more of a discussion for, for afterwards or a chat with uh, 
and the Jasmine team more is um, how we um, we sort of quite used to using uh, Dask libraries for parallel processing, but a lot of the easy ways of using object storage and conversion based object storage now uses Apache Beam and getting apps work on Jasmine is mean, something we've yet investigated, but it's something we're interested in trying. Um, and it's actually what the resources, the, the repository that I just showed uh, is using uh, to do. Um, and uh, at the moment, it's a standalone repository, and we do want to integrate that with, um, better integrate that with notebooks and, and the Jasper notebook service and, and or data labs. Um, so talking of notebooks uh, is also something I found quite useful uh, of late. Um, so previously, the, before this, I've been to run notebooks on Jasper, and I've been hosting my own notebook server, uh, sort of surface for not the right word and, and doing some fiddly port forwarding to make it all work. So having a dedicated service that does this is incredibly useful. So I can I can sort of web page and all my stuff is there, especially now that uh, I am able to write the group workspace disks area, something that was missing for quite some time. Um, and that is that means that I can do the analysis um, that I need to do um, using this service rather than always trying to make make it work myself manually. That's been very useful in particular for the project that's on the right, which is um, well, it's, it's part of the Hydrojules project, but I'm developing a, uh, a modeling framework called Unify. I don't ask me what it stands for, I can't remember and didn't come up with the acronym. Um, or I think the H of Hydrology, which if I remember, it's a silent page. Um, um, and in the sort of testing and debugging of this, it's been great just to have a notebook, a notebook service that I can just go on to and have a month. Um, and do all these uh, do all these sort of exploratory debugging and analysis and uh, first steps of developing this further, um, which is why I find notebooks very useful anyway. Um, I have put one caveat on there, um, which is where, which is one area where data labs does differ in that it is quite collaborative compared to uh, this notebook service, which so there might be, but the question is not. Uh, necessary or, or, or the right question to ask, but we have had, there been some cases where I wanted to share what some of the notebooks that I'm doing with other people and getting that to work between the tricky. So that might be something uh, to flag up as a conversation to have later. Um, and also a recent addition to this has been that there is now a, a, a DAS gateway service that uh, Jasmine operates, which is made using DAS, which is a parallelization library uh, that I use for all my modeling work, um, um, much easier to use on the, Lotus, high end Lotus, um, Lotus, whatever it's called, um, HPC resource adjustment. Um, so that's something I would like to flag up as, yeah, really useful. That's been great. Having trying to set that my name myself has been a nightmare previously. So again, having something that has got the support behind it has been really, really useful. Um, that's notebooks. What else have I got? Oh, yes. That's, I talked a lot about these data labs things, but not really explained what they are. Um, as Amelia promised, I would. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, these are built on top of, they're not managed by Jasmine directly, but they're built on the unmanaged cloud, uh, so that's a cloud section of, of the Jasmine resources that are available. Um, and that's, it's sort of, I see it as a, um, as a place, it's a place for collaborative work, notebook work, working. So you, you have notebooks like you have on the Jasmine notebook service, which is one way of coding and doing some exploratory uh, analysis. Um, but in a more, in slightly more project space with sort of other resources bottled up to the side. So you, you do, you've got more control over who can access stuff and where your data is. And um, that's, I haven't actually used them in a while. <laughs> He says, uh, "Quite familiar with that one." Um, and I guess the key point is being able to work collaboratively in real time on my notebooks as well, and then um, share them, publish them, uh, have public facing um, portals and websites that are backed by this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so I see it as collaborative notebook working, which is um, quite similar to the Jasmine notebook service, but I think it has a few more features. However, um, and I think again, this is not quite the right form to bring this up in. Um, uh, it, it has its own teething problems and, and difficulties. And I think one of the things we are trying to work to get to grips with is um, what the resource that back this is. Because there's no, I mean, we never get a straight answer out of it. I imagine it's, that's probably because there isn't an easy answer. 
Um, so for those of us who are trying to do slightly more, or um, uh, what's the word, uh, um, intensive compute stuff on here, which perhaps might not might be not the right thing to be doing in the first place, that's also a conversation to have. Um, so, so particularly for, for some people in my group and, and in this group too, who are doing a lot of modeling work, um, it's quite fiddly to, you can use, use Dask on this service, um, but it's quite fiddly to set up. And so that's not great for getting people to use this source or this source um, resource. Um, what else is there? And there's no clear, you have this much resource to use. If you go over it, that's it. Then it's very much, you can run your code and if you're lucky, it will run, it might run out of memory, but who knows, it changes each time. Um, and there's, that, those are the sorts of problems we're having. Um, and sort of linking back to the object storage stuff, that's another thing that's been quite difficult to, to use on this service, which is um, that um, whilst it, they do have dedicated disk space for each project, for a different collection of notebooks, essentially, um, that it's not big enough for the work we need to do. So we have trying to use the object storage for this, but the link between the two isn't particularly there yet. And that's, that's something else to work on. Um, did I have another slide? Let's find out. I did. Um, so yes, I've also mentioned um, Lotus, um, the sort of um, cluster that doesn't provide, which has been uh, yeah, very useful. Um, I'll get to the logo in a minute. Um, in particular, um, I have to say the uh, the high memory queue uh, and partition, which Amelia has also mentioned, has been a lifesaver on more than one occasion, where I've not been able to find the resource or or not been able to improve my code enough to run on other uh, um, resources that we have access to at CEH and, and elsewhere. Um, so the one particular project that this where this has been crucial for is um, the official name was OpenClim, but um, I was working on a um, on the agricultural side of this at the time, um, which was um, this project was looking at um, trying to come up with an integrated assessment of how climate change will impact all sorts of areas of uh, of the UK, from biodiversity to housing to land use changes to um, uh, water resources and demand and agriculture and all sorts of things. Uh, so we were looking at crops and how they might change. Um, the suitability of certain crops might change. And I was trying to do suitability assessments um, based on temperature and precipitation projections. Um, what you know, how that would affect the suitability of crops. Um, for which I, that's where the name comes from. Um, I like to try and plug that as very fast as possible. Um, so the the reason it's called I call it top of the crops is that this will come up with uh, rankings of different crops um, and how their suitability changes going forward and back. And that was one of the uh, metrics we came up with. Um, but yeah, the you'd be able to use the high memory queue, which we've not yet found the limit for, has been very useful. Um, so uh, this is a so this was a, we were trying to do this over one kilometer grid over the UK for several hundred crops. Uh, for 100 years of daily data and another couple of other axes of variation on there. And so the, the amount of funnel function that had to be done got almost out of hand, uh, but just been saved today on this occasion. Um, I think that is all the slides I have. Hi there, I'm Nathan Assault. I am um, working with Thicky and Mark Rudd Smith on the LTLSFP uh, project, which is one of the NERC's freshwater quality programs. Um, and um, we're working on the freshwater model. So the aim of the LTLS FE project, which stands for long-term large-scale freshwater refer systems, is to quantify the uh, impact of climate change and socioeconomic change um, on, on freshwater quality and biodiversity. And um, we're developing the freshwater model for this. And uh, very important model models the transport, transformation beds of uh, chemicals, pollutants in rivers and groundwater. Um, Accounting for any hydrological changes under these different future scenarios. Uh, we'll be running this model over a 100 year period down to a small time step of about two hours um, across five by five kilometer grids of the UK. Um, so, these future scenarios that I'm mentioning. Uh, the plausible combinations of climate change scenarios, which are quantified by RCPs or representative concentration pathways, and shared social economic pathways or recipes, which um, are kind of like the stories of what could happen to UK society in the future 
and that provides us with um, changes, projected changes for the future for up, up until 2080, I think, of um, how population might change, how land use might change, how um, pollution rates might change. Um, so yeah, that combined with the climate change scenarios, which will give us basically the degree of global warming that will go along with these with these um, stories. Um, yeah, so combined with that, we're trying to run the model and make some predictions. Um, so this model requires lots of inputs. We need, um, we're, we're modeling pollutants from lots of different sources. We've got metals from abandoned mines, we've got pesticides from agriculture, um, we've got uh, micro pollutants from urban runoff and sewage, which include things like pharmaceutical and um, industrial chemicals and personal care products. Um, so again, lots of pollutants. And so what we do with the um, freshwater model is we take all those chemicals, we transport them down surface runoff and rivers throughout the UK. Um, there's a little dummy animation that doesn't seem to be working here, so <laughs> never mind that. Um, and yeah, so we, we run these from, 20, uh, from 1980 to 2080, and we give our outputs of the project, projected concentrations to um, uh, a biological model, which also doesn't seem to appear on the slide, a biological model which is going to then use those uh, concentrations, the, the outputs that we generate, to see what the impacts would be um, on the biodiversity in, um, in UK rivers. So yeah, bringing that all together is, um, well, we, we need a lot of computing power for this, and Jasmine allows us to, to do this. It provides us with a, a high-performance computing power using the Lotus cluster, uh, which does things like enabling parallel processing of different scenarios, which take a lot of time, so great. Uh, another advantage is direct access to the CEDA archive, which we need for our climate data. And group workspace, as mentioned before, is great for multiple people or even organizations, like, like yeah, for this project as well, to um, collaborate with folks. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. And that is everything from my group. Um, questions and contact details on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you all.